Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ty Smith. I'm the director of the California State Railroad Museum. Hi, and I'm Cheryl Marcel, president and CEO of the California State Railroad Museum Foundation. It is our pleasure to bring you this special members only sneak peek of the magic of scale model railroading. The day has come. To, you know, tomorrow, we're on the eve of it. Tomorrow, I know. We're so exciting. Open up and unveil the magic of scale model railroading. Uh, to the public. This has been an exhibit that's a long time in the making. Um, it's an extraordinary new exhibit. It's a great compliment to the third floor here at the California State Railroad Museum. But we did want to give our museum members a sneak peek, a chance Absolutely. to see it before uh, everyone else. And so we're here tonight to offer that sneak peek. And um, earlier we had uh, Charlie Getz come by. Uh, he's the, the former president of the NMRA and really the driving force behind this whole exhibit. Uh, the mm -hmm. person uh, with whom we are proud to say we have partnered uh, and, and his organization. Um, and he came through and, and did a whole ex ex exhibit preview. Great. Uh, and so we're going to show that. But there is an opportunity also uh, at the end of the video uh, to come back and um, have questions. So if you have questions, you can text message them with your thumbs uh, to 916-365-2070. And we might answer your question later. Uh, in the broadcast. But for right now, all you have to do is sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy the sneak peek tr uh, tour of this uh, very impressive exhibit. Enjoy. Hi, my name is Charles Getz. Uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to be here with you. And I just want to introduce myself. Uh, I am a former president of the National Model Railroad Association. Uh, that is the entity that is uh, sponsoring and has put together this exhibit you're about to see. And also, I'm happy to say I was uh, one of the people who helped do this exhibit, plan it, uh, install it, although the hard work was done by a professional team, believe me, along with a fellow by the name of Bob Brown, who uh, is editor of a leading model railroad magazine. So um, fasten your seatbelts and let's take a look at the exhibit. We're in the uh, beginning of the exhibit. The trestle is, is interesting because, because of a couple of things. Number one, uh, it, it marries the two most uh, extreme scales that we have in scale model railroading. We have what we call G or large scale for the big trestle. And then in the trestle is a replication of the big trestle in what's called N scale. And then uh, over on the far wall, as you first come in, you'll see a wall sized picture of a model railroad, and this is from probably the most famous model railroad of all time. It was called the Gory and Defeated, built by a fellow named John Allen down in Monterey, California. Uh, tragically, this railroad burned down uh, with the house uh, three or four days after John Allen died, but it was in its day uh, one of the most spectacular ever built. This is kind of um, uh, emblematic of what model railroading can be if you go to an extreme and you happen to ha have a very artistic talent. And then we have our title. And as you can see, it's presented by the National Model Railroad Association. The National Model Railroad Association is the world's largest scale model railroad group. It was formed in 1935. And it, uniquely, it set standards for the industry, even way back then, to ensure that no matter who made railroad equipment, whatever scale it was in, and we'll talk about that later, that each piece would fit and work with the other. It would be as if Apple and, and Microsoft decided they were going to make everything compatible. Wouldn't that have been a different world uh, instead of proprietary? So that's what the association did and still does to this day. And now that we've turned the corner, if you will, and we're entering the beginning of the, uh, of the real exhibit, uh, you'll see a series of model railroads and dioramas the first one is a very interesting piece. Uh, it's in a scale called O scale. But what's interesting is that this, this model railroad called Smuggler's Cove, which was built for this exhibit, was built in Australia by two modelers who had never been to New England, and yet it is a fabulous uh, representation of a New England coastal town with a little model railroad that serves that little coastal town. And it's very, very detailed. Uh, the two gentlemen who built it um, in Australia loved this part of the United States. Uh, they studied pictures and they built, built this thing and it took them about a year or so to do it. It was shipped from Australia and uh, assembled back here. 
Uh, and here it is for your enjoyment. The second model railroad, and it's more of a diorama, is actually a, a miniature of a place you can visit today. Uh, it's called Chama, New Mexico, which is the name of the town. It's in very northern New Mexico near the Colorado border. And this represents the way the Chama, New Mexico looked in 1955. But most, if not all, of the buildings and the items that you see in this diorama are still in existence. It was a, uh, a major point where the steam-powered Denver and Rio Grande Western narrow gauge uh, operated. And here's where the crew would change uh, between the two points of Alamosa, Colorado, and Durango. On the opposite wall from Chama begins what we call our timeline. Scale model railroading actually goes back to when real railroading began. In 1847, Lord Alfred Tennyson wrote a poem about a garden party he had attended in, a, in an English country estate. And in that poem called The Princess, he described this, this opulent garden party. And one of the features of the party was a miniature steam-powered model railroad, and it was puffing in the garden. And he, he made a note of that, and he put it in the poem. Below that, you'll see a model ship, and you might think that's strange, but it's the Titanic. And there is a connection between the Titanic and scale model railroading, which would seem weird at first. And here's the connection. In England, in the early 1900s, there was actually a model railroad publication. And there were some American subscribers to that publication. In fact, there were quite a few. In May 1912, they did not get their edition of that magazine in the mail. And the reason is the entire edition for America from England went down on the Titanic where it had been shipped. The rest of this narrative goes in chronological order from that point, the 19th century, into all the way to the modern era, 40 feet down the wall. It has over 400 items. It also has a number of signs and, and explanatory data. You can take a look at that and read it at your pleasure. But the common theme is this, that scale model railroading has always striven toward greater and greater realism. And it combines the best of technology. We now have digital control and digital sound and the best of tradition, meaning you can model any era, any time frame. You can recreate whatever you wish. So it's a fun hobby for those of us who are in it. The next uh, model railroad, and it is a model railroad, is actually kind of well known in the hobby itself. It's called the San Juan Central. It was built specifically for a series of magazine articles in the leading model railroad magazine, Model Railroader. Uh, and it was described uh, by the builder and how to build it. And then later on, it was put into a book form. And believe it or not, that book is still available. It's still in print. It's about how to build this particular model railroad. Easy, step-by-step -step process. And this was built, as I said, by a fellow who is an artist in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He does uh, modern Western art. And he's very, very, uh, very, very popular. But he did something very unusual for the era. It was built in the 1980s, and it still looks pretty darn good. What he did that was so unusual is the scenery. The scenery normally is built of something called uh, plaster cloth. We do that nowadays. It's the kind of thing that people use for bandages in, in hospitals. But it's draped over a framework to make the contours of scenery. He didn't do that because it's very fragile. What he did is he used construction foam out of a can that you get at Home Depot or Lowe's or one of those. And he squirted it into a rubber mold of a rock for example, or just on a framework, and he sculpted it while it dried, and then he made scenery that was very light, very, very versatile and, and reliable, and very strong. Across the aisle, seen from Northern California, the town of Occidental, and this is the way it looked in the 1890s, on a railroad, the North Pacific Coast, in Marin County, uh, up near Sonoma County, Next to it is one of the smaller pieces, but it's a diorama that replicates a Matthew Brady photo of the American Civil War. There's a mortar on a little flat car replicated on this model with every person in the photograph also replicated 
in the model itself. The next diorama is a piece of a model railroad from a uh, fellow in Michigan. He modeled uh, the ore docks and the ore, iron ore model, uh, railroads of the Michigan and Upper Peninsula. And his model here represents one of those ore docks loading a ship and a hillside station with what is called, and it's a weird name, a camelback locomotive. That's where the engineer was perched in a cab on top of the boiler. Now, why did they do that? Because the coal they burned in those days was so awful that they had to have a very, very wide firebox because they had to burn a lot of coal to get a little bit of energy. And that was called uh, a Wooten firebox, and there wasn't room to put a cab on it. So they had to move the cab up in the front. The next diorama is from a fellow, a, a friend of mine named Jim Vale, no longer with us, sadly. And this shows the West Side uh, Lumber Company sawmill that was in existence in Tuolumne, uh, California, near Sonora, um, in the 1900s into the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And I think it was torn down roughly in the 1960s. But it's a pretty accurate representation of that. And this is also a piece of his model railroad served by the railroad. The West Side Lumber Company had its own railroad. They would bring logs from the Sierras down to the sawmill where they processed, turned into lumber, shipped out on the um, uh, standard gauge railroads, the Sierra Railroad, which is still there also in that area. And the last little diorama in this particular hall is also by the same fellow, Jim Vale, who built the sawmill, also from his model railroad, also a California scene. This is one that's been gone for many, many years, but it's called the Holmes Lime Company. This operation was down in Santa Cruz County, served by a, a railroad, and it created lime, which is used for processing, uh, from the natural limestone in the area. Uh, it's long gone, but this is an accurate representation of the way that particular industry looked. Now, both of these dioramas illustrate something that model railroaders do. If you remember the San Juan Central, that's entirely fictional. It doesn't exist. You remember Chama we looked at. That's a real place. These two uh, dioramas are real places, but they've been shortened or they've been slightly modified to fit a particular space. But they are... Uh, saving and recreating the history of the area. And that's something that model railroaders like to do. They like to recreate an era and try to be as accurate as they can or recreate a particular location or a particular industry. And uh, it, it's a way of preserving our history. All right, we're now in the North Gallery, the, the most busy of the exhibit and also the last uh, section of the exhibit. And behind me, is a wall and a display case with nothing but magazine covers, past and present. Model railroading is rich around the world in magazines, even to this digital day. It's a very, very inexpensive way of learning more about model railroading because it tells you uh, what products are available in the ads, and it also has articles and things about model railroading, and you can learn a little bit about it. Probably the most spectacular part of this entire gallery, uh, North Gallery, is what we call the wall of trains. It is 40 feet long. And what's interesting about this wall, and I don't think it's ever been uh, replicated anywhere else that I've ever seen, is that all of the trains on this wall represent real trains and their full length. They came from a fellow named Kevin Shanahan's collection. And his passion was to recreate trains the way they were at a point in time and make them as accurate as they could be. There are two shelves that are kind of of special interest. The most bottom shelf before you get to the floor shelf is an old time train from the same fellow that built that ore dock we showed you earlier. And that ore dock uh, and, and this trainer from that same era, the 1900s. And each one of the cars in that train is hand built by that modeler over decades of time. Right above it is, an, is a 40 foot long shelf of what we call refrigerator cars. What's interesting about that shelf is that they're from one manufacturer of model railroad goods called Howell Day. They represent those cars the way they were in the 1930s, but many of the kits that are on display that are built up are from the 1930s with cardboard and paper sides. So this is quite a wall. It has all of the different sizes in model railroading from N scale, even uh, Z scale, 
all the way up to large scale, which is on the floor or up on the top shelf. The handrail that separates the wall of trains from the aisle has a lot of little individual pieces of colorful cardboard you'll look at. And these are model railroad passes. Now, what's interesting about this? Well, real railroads, mostly in the 19th and early 20th century, issued passes, which were like free tickets for their employees or important customers so they could ride on the railroad without having to buy a fare or a ticket. Model railroads use these pass, the pass idea. When you visit their model railroad, they would give you a pass as a souvenir of the railroad, and often it has funny uh, conditions. Real passes would say things like, not good on this particular train, not good on this particular day, uh, but whatever the conditions were. Uh, the, the, the funny model railroad passes, and some of them show uh, what those conditions are, will say things like pets are not allowed because, boy, they can ruin a model railroad quickly. Things like that, little, little silly things. Opposite the wall of trains is what uh, we who designed this exhibit consider probably the most important part. And that is the message about if you're interested in this hobby, how do you, how do you get into it? What do you do? What decisions do you make? And what is the path to, to learn more about model railroading? So this, this wall, which looks, we call it the parts wall for reasons that should be obvious when you visit. There are hundreds and hundreds of commercially available pieces and parts on this wall. It also draws a narrative about the, the thought process you make when be, be deciding to become a model railroader. For example, choosing a scale is one of the first things you do. And here we have, uh, using a very familiar locomotive, uh, that since the mid-50s and Christmas, uh, the war bonnet scheme on the Santa Fe uh, has been has been obvious, and the real one is uh, in the museum, too, one of them. Uh, it shows you the different scales, from large scale to O scale to S scale, the most popular scale, which is HO, uh, which stands for half of O, by the way. Um, o scale in England is 7 millimeters to the foot, which is a very complicated scale. HO scale is half of that, 3.5 millimeters to the foot, also very complicated, roughly one-eighth inch to the foot. And then you have smaller, like TT, which is no longer in, in vogue, end scale I've mentioned a few times, and finally the smallest uh, commercially viable scale called Z, as in Z, Z scale. Typical workbench starts off the um, exhibit, uh, this particular display, uh, and this uh, shows some of the tools and, and a model under uh, work, uh, and the clutter, which is very, very typical. And then it goes down the line about choosing your railroad type. Do you want to model uh, mainline modeling or a short line model? Or do you want to model a mining railroad or a interurban? Uh, you pick track you might want to use. You pick structures you may want to use. You pick scenery items you may want to use. And today's hobby is the best and easiest it's ever been to get started. And if you needed any more information about how to build a model railroad, we provided that right here. This is a model railroad under construction, built especially for this exhibit, which shows three phases in the model railroad construction aspect. The bench work and the rough, you can see we use pink and blue foam, you can get at Home Depot or anywhere, uh, is, is, is one of the phases with very simple wiring and then we start the detailing. We start the rough uh, scenery with rock castings, and we're putting in some color, and you can see that here. And then finally, the extra detailing. And the best part about this whole thing is that kids and anybody can come here, push a red button, and we have a train that is operating. If you look at this thing, it's not only a diorama. It's a, a, a series of models put together that look like a real place but it runs. In other words, that's what sets model railroading apart from other um, uh, activities that do models. That is, our stuff works and runs. And that's what really makes it kind of fun because once you finish it, the fun isn't over, it's just beginning. And we'll go look at the operator's corner to see exactly what I'm talking about in that regard. Model railroaders always say that building the model railroad is only half the fun. The second half of the fun is the get together and actually run their model railroad just like the real railroad. Now, you might think that's silly, but think of it as a big game because that's really what it is. It's an intellectual challenge to keep on a schedule. We have a real 
centralized traffic control CTC machine salvaged from a railroad that has been modified for a model railroad so that you can control all of the switches and turnouts from this machine. It can keep track of where the train is and it'll show you where it is just like the real thing. That same John Allen fellow at the very beginning of this tour with a big photograph on the wall of his most famous model railroad, he came up with a puzzle uh, a game that actually operated called the Time Saver. And that is the Time Saver. It didn't burn in the fire. That Time Saver is a, is a game where you put a locomotive and some cars and you have to shuffle them around, move them around in a particular set series of moves and figure out the fastest way to do it. And you play against each other. Who can move these cars from A to B and B to C the fastest and most accurately? All right, and the very last part of the exhibit I'm going to show you is uh, what we call Modeler's Corner. Now, this is, looks like it's a hodgepodge of a bunch of individual things, but there's a lot of interest here, especially for those of us in the hobby already, but for the general public, too. These are some of the giants in model railroading from all eras that are represented by the models they built from the 1930s on to the almost present day. And individual models are told, uh, their stories are told in a panel, so I won't repeat those stories. But I do want to draw your attention to a couple of, a couple of items. To me, what I consider one of the most interesting locomotives is one of the earliest, and that's on the floor. That is built, a live steam model, which means it really would operate, built in 1873 by the grandson of Eli Whitney. Now, we don't have it because it's the grandson of Eli Whitney. We have it because it's an early locomotive hand-built by a model railroader in 1873. What's even more interesting is that the locomotive was built from a photo, not from a photograph or the real thing, but from a Courier and Ives print. And we have the original Courier and Ives print of that locomotive right behind the model. And that's what I want to close on this tour. The one thing about uh, probably all hobbies, but the one thing about our hobby, and this was told me by a design professional in the museum world years ago, and it's stuck with me ever since. He wanted to know, why are we model railroaders? And I had a hard time answering because I don't really know why we're model railroaders. But then he came up with the answer. He said, oh, you do this because you have to, meaning there's something inside of us that wants to build things with our hands, and those things we build are affiliated with railroads. We love trains, and we love models. Therefore, we love model trains. We love building them. So hopefully you'll come and see this exhibit, and hopefully you'll realize that with your support and your help, this exhibit was possible. Without you, it would not have happened. So thank you for your support. I look forward to maybe meeting some of you one day, and I hope you enjoy the exhibit. Welcome back. Uh, I'm joined now by Charlie Getz. Charlie, what a wonderful tour. Well, thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope the uh, viewers liked it. Yeah, we um, did put up a text message number for people to uh, text message questions, and I suspect we'll have some, but I, I had a lot of questions sure. too. And you know, you know, some of the history uh, for me, I came here four years ago, Yes. and uh, what, what I encountered was a really a great inheritance. You know, this museum, all of the effort, uh, uh, heart that went into it beforehand. And, and one of the things that was sitting on my desk was this proud partnership agreement <laughs> that talked about the eventuality of building in conjunction with the NMRA, um, this exhibit, this very exhibit. And I know that it's been a windy road, but even for my own edification, I've been part of it, but I haven't been part of the whole story. So sure. what did it take to get here? Well, it took quite a bit because after all, the National Model Railroad Association, which is the sponsor of this, is not a museum affiliated group by any stretch. And so I think uh, rightly we had to overcome a little bit of, of uh, skepticism about our bona fides, whether <laughs> we could do this or not. And we debated whether we could do this. Uh, we know the hobby extremely well, but we don't know museum um, exhibits. Mm -hmm. So we were happy to partner and, and hire a firm that was very good at that. And between that firm, our ideas, and, um, and the museum staff looking at our plans, it came out better than we ever would have expected. Yeah, yeah no, it really was a, a, a collaboration. Yes, a lot it of, was. A lot of good people behind it, a lot of, a lot of thought, intention, and Absolutely. heart uh, behind it, just like the museum itself, and we're just really happy to have it here. Uh, one of the questions I'm asked a lot as the museum director is, how long is it going to be here? 
Well, we hope for a long time. Yeah. We uh, <laughs> under the proud partnership agreement, I believe it's a ten year term. Uh, and we'd love to have it uh, last longer than that, but it's up to the folks that come here and whether they like it and yeah. whether they find it interesting, and we think they will. Yeah. But uh, we don't know. No one's seen it yet uh, officially from the uh, from the public. Well, I, I think so. I'm excited about it. The, for those of you who've been to the museum, you know the third floor uh, is you know very much the area where we talk about toy trains and we have the Junior Engineer Discovery Zone. <laughs> so you have lots of little kids playing on the Thomas right. the toy train. But then then the question is, what's next? Uh, you know, after that. And so having then model trains and the hobby and the craft behind sure, that sure. of every range um, is really exciting. And to professionally uh, extend the, um, the exhibit space up here is really exciting uh, for my great. part. So we'll, 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 people will, will be up here and we'll see the response. But we, we're, I hope we're sure happy it. to have it. <laughs> oh, that's great. We're happy to be here and we're very pleased. This yeah. is, uh, if not the best, it's certainly in the top two and a half uh, m uh, railroad museums in the, in the world. And I've been to a bunch of them, believe we'll, me. We'll take that. <laughs> we, get, we know we have some good company, and we're, we're you, proud to be a part do. of that. So yes, you do. For sure. So uh, model trains are a big part of the core of our collection, and of course sure. we have a lot of them around. We had some integrated within other sections of the museum. It's really exciting to mm -hmm. devote uh, a good chunk of the museum to talking about this because there's a lot of history behind it. It's not yes. just what you – Oh, yes. It, it's process and product, and it's also a long history behind it. So uh, how far does it go back? Uh, when was the first model – uh, to train uh, <laughs> done. Do you know that? No, I wish we did. <laughs> uh, and I don't think it was around a Christmas tree. Right, but right. Uh, but I do know that uh, one of one of our donors uh, mentioned in our uh, in our thank you donor wall, which uh, which the public will see, uh, is a fellow who um, who collected early models. And one of the models he collected from England goes back to about I think it was 1823. And it's very interesting. It was a, a large model. It's now back at the British Museum, but it was actually a model built by the inventor or, or one of the early inventors of steam locomotives before they built the real steam locomotive to see if it worked mm. so they built a miniature version of what they hoped to build uh, in about 1823-25 and it was live steam and they ran it and it ran around and the track and it worked it didn't blow up it didn't kill people right. and they said great let's build the real one and they did and that was one of the first locomotives in england so in some ways model railroads uh, kind of either uh, preceded the real thing or were at the same time. And yeah. I think that's true. Humans always want to model things yeah. in miniature no, that's true. from from life, whether it's a cave painting of a of a bison <laughs> that's this big or whatever. And so I think that model railroading uh, probably goes back to the beginning yeah. of railroads. I, th I think you're probably right. <laughs> um, you know, it's one of those things where it's not my hobby, right. uh, but I think one of the things about the community of this place, and, and I, I think mm -hmm. this of you too, but um, it's when you talk to people and you, sure. you get inspired by their passion, even if you don't share the exact right. passion, you know, it really is, um, uh, neat. And uh, I'm reminded of the late Dr. Denny Onsbach, one of the yes. founding patriarchs oh, yeah. of the Great California guy. state railroad museum. And I think I remember the moment that I got it, you know, I was like, oh, this, what is the model train stuff sure. about? And he said, well, Ty, for me, he was an oncologist. Yes. And so he, he, he said that every day he was dealing with patients who were suffering, who were at some stage of cancer, worried about getting it. Uh, having it, you know, all of that. And for him, it was a refuge that he would go up into his yeah. model train room. And for the moment that he was up there, he was able to focus on a world in miniature, as sure. you mentioned, mm -hmm. but then also a world that he controlled completely. Right? Oh, yes. And, yeah, and, and we, we don't get that in life, no, you know, to control no. our eyes completely, but in these things you do. So what, what's your background with the hobby? What have you, what got you into it? Well, I, I had a pretty demanding job also. It wasn't anything like, uh, like the doctor's <laughs> job, but, uh, and, and, he, it's, he's absolutely correct. Uh, it is a refuge, but for other people in the hobby, and, and I include myself in this, it's also a way to kind of do something creative. Uh, uh, it's a way to preserve the history, and we have exhibits showing that, of, of, model, of railroading, uh, recreating a real place in, 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 in a particular t time frame that really existed, that calls to you, and you want to make, make it that way, mm. the way it was. Now, Painters do that, and they call it art. I would not go so far as to call what we do art, but some do. I don't. <laughs> uh, but it, it, in that sense, it, it's fulfilling on many, many levels, mm. and it does take you away from the everyday stress and and, uh, yeah. and worry. It yeah. really does. Yeah. yeah, he gave me the eyes to see it, and I, I see the same passion in you, <laughs> sure. and I, I'm on board. <laughs> um, one of the th questions we had was about um, STEM and STEAM, and, sure. and I believe, you know, this is something I say all the time in the sure. museum, 
that our highest calling is to be a laboratory of learning. Yes. Uh, it's, it, and, and beyond the field trip, like learning by doing and getting uh, students involved, at, uh, uh, and then also lifelong learners too. Right. So um, can, can we use model uh, railroading to engage in uh, science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics? Absolutely. In fact, there's a, a teacher uh, in the East Bay who has a math class, uh, and he has his students actually build a model railroad, work on a model railroad in the classroom to teach them geometry, arithmetic, uh, the things of calculation you have to go through. The, uh, the interesting thing about model railroading is that you have to master a lot of different skills to build models and to build a layout, a model railroad carpentry, electricity, um, painting, uh, making scenery out of, you know, in some cases out of plaster, out of all sorts of things. Uh, and, and making miniatures teaches you discipline, delay, deferred gratification, it takes time <laughs> to build these things, and working with, uh, with, with small parts uh, teaches you patience, uh, and it teaches you sticking and perseverance, sticking to a project. Yeah. So these are all great yeah. life lessons for kids. Yeah. And uh, and as one of our uh, mentors who works with kids says, he, he, he starts out his lesson with the, with the kids saying, you know how to use these. I'm going to teach you how to use these. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is which is really true. No, that's that's wonderful. Yeah. We're, we're excited about that. You know, here the prospect sure. of that teaching, you know, and, and being a laboratory of learning and using model trains for that. Um, of course, museums are the keepers of the real stuff. That's yes, the power. That's and so true. people can come and see and behold and stand in right. front of the real deal. So um, every exhibit includes the rare and the superlative. <laughs> What's right. in this exhibit that's rare and uh, uh, that, that, you know, people are the must see? Well, there's a lot of inside the ballpark for us model railroaders, <laughs> which I won't bore you with. But the thing I think would be most interesting for a lot of people, we have all nine gold plated locomotives. And what I mean by that is. Uh, a lot of the uh, locomotives uh, back in the 1950s, 1960s were built overseas in Japan out of brass. Mm. And they were very, very detailed, very detailed. And they revolutionized uh, locomotives uh, before they were quite crude. And once in a while, the, the Japanese makers of those locomotives were so excited about getting an order because the economy there was so bad after the war that they would gold plate, 22 karat gold plate a locomotive and send it to the importer as a thank you gift. Ah. And there were nine of those known to exist. And uh, due to the generosity of one of our donors, we have all nine, which are displayed in public for the first time ever. They're here? They're here. Never been seen. And some of their counterpart models that from that same production that weren't gold-plated are rare themselves. Wow. So all nine of those are lined up uh, next to the ones that were produced and could be sold. Wow. So that's kind of just one, one exhibit yeah. of many. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I, I think back, and whenever I say I'm the I'm the uh, director of the railroad museum, mm -hmm. uh, I get a, I get a range of comments. But one of the most universal comments is, "Oh, I remember having a, <laughs> right. a toy train underneath yeah, my we, we get tree around Christmas." But I know sure. that I know there's a difference. Yes, uh, between, there is a difference. And we have toy trains up here, and now we have model trains. Yes. So, so what what are what are the differences? They're both wonderful hobbies. Uh, they're different hobbies. Uh, Toy trains, and I use my left hand, toy trains are more rugged. They're uh, a little uh, less uh, realistic sometimes. Uh, they have maybe coarser features, and I'm not putting them down because they're very valuable uh, in that sense uh, of, of fun and, and enjoyment. Uh, scale model trains tend to be very, very accurate to the original. So they're accurate r representations of the real thing in a miniature set scale, uh, and that's the whole idea of scale model railroading is that you want to be as accurate as you can. Yeah, you yeah. can still have fun, but you want to be a little more accurate. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, now, you are you were the past president of the NMRA, yes. uh, but, but a much celebrated past president. <laughs> um, so uh, can you give us a little more information about the NMRA? Sure. And, uh, and uh, what, what's it about and, oh, sure. and how can people find out more information about okay, it? Okay, the NMRA, National Model Railroad Association, is the oldest uh, and largest scale model railroad association in the world formed in 1935 in the depths of the depression which is kind of interesting and the hobby exploded during mm -hmm. the depression uh people were out of work and and even though you think they were probably had no money they always had a few pennies here and there to build a cardboard something yeah. or to occupy their time and we actually set standards for the industry mm -hmm. and um so we can Im imagine if we had been able to do this in silicon valley 
uh, your Apple cord would plug into your uh, your device uh, if you're Android, and you wouldn't have to buy different cords because interoperability is what we are all about. But we also teach our members how to be better at the hobby. We have conventions, we have get-togethers, we have a lot of fun. We're open to anybody, age-wise, or uh, obviously uh, we don't discriminate. And it's a great organization, so it's a yeah. lot of fun. Wonderful. Well, we certainly have many members, many visitors, many mm -hmm. uh, volunteers who are also part of the NMRA family, so it's a natural fit well, that we're all together here uh, in this way. And you can go to nmra.org to find out a lot about us. And for the younger folks, it isn't, isn't me because I wouldn't know how to do this. There's a QR code ah. <laughs> uh, in the exhibit where they can just yeah. take a picture and go right to the website. Lots of different ways to do it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, I want to reiterate now that the exhibit, you got a sneak peek tonight, and I'm mm -hmm. glad everybody, thank you everybody for tuning in to see the sneak peek. Um, but the, you can come see it for yourself. Uh, the museum is back open. Of course, we are at limited capacity. Um, but there's there's still plenty of space for folks. Uh, there, there have been lines, but not terribly long ones. Of course, all of the standard COVID stuff is uh, in place. So if you come down, wear your face mask, and uh, you might have to wait uh, five minutes to get in. But mm -hmm. it's well worth it because now, in addition to all the other great <laughs> stuff that we have, we have the NMRA exhibit, and we're going to take out the stanchions and just sort of celebrate. You That's know the great. fact that it was a long time, a uh, long time coming. Um, oh. This is a great question. Sure. This is, kind of, this, this is a lie. This is a lie, oh, sure, right? Sure, so it's sure. coming at us. Um, uh, how do you do model model uh, uh, railroading in limited space? Like, two ways of doing it. Okay. There are two ways of doing it. Uh, we are uh, very big on, on, on saying you can model, have a model railroad no matter what your circumstance. There are scales. Scale is the relationship ah. of the model to the real thing that are very small. And we have those on exhibit here. That's one way of getting ah. a little bit more. But if your eyes won't quite let you do that, you can have a more modest model railroad and what we call a switching model railroad. It doesn't go around in circles, but it goes back and forth ah. and it becomes a puzzle game. You know, you have to move uh, freight cars just like the real thing does in a certain small confined space in a certain time frame. So it can be as, a, as exciting and rewarding as having a, 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 a garage or a room full <laughs> of trains. So uh, d now I have no excuse, even in my... <laughs> Uh, a small apartment. I ha I I should no. You I can you can do it. So you can, in fact, <laughs> when I was in college at UCLA, I actually had a uh, we called N scale model railroads that slid under the bed in my apartment, and uh, I'd bring it out when I got stressed out about finals. Yeah, or whatever, right, right, right. <laughs> run a train and go, things go just kind of melted away. I, I we have one that's been on display. Sure. That's a suitcase. These yes. Oh yeah. yeah. And in Japan, we yeah. saw actually a, a modeler who built a little layout on a guitar. Ah. In a guitar, oh, wow. so it's kind of strange. It really is a, a combination of art and creativity, and that a, a, and a way that yeah, engages that uh, head, heart, and hand. Uh, you Absolutely, know, in, in a way, and and sure. anything like that uh, is, is is worth looking at because um, absolutely, it's worth it, looking yeah. into, and that's yeah. what this exhibit helps. How, you how do people look into? I know that like there's a kind of a discipline behind it. There's a shelf of books to which mm -hmm. uh, we are accountable in a certain way, and yes. knowing the history of it and then other resources. So where do people find out more? Well, they find out on the internet, number one, mm -hmm. because that's what's happening nowadays. And if you, uh, if you Google, and pardon the expression, if you Google uh, model railroading, you'll probably be uh, hitting three million hits or something. You don't want right. to do that. Right. But there are the old-fashioned folks like us, there are actually magazines out uh -huh. there uh, you can get at uh, Barnes & Noble and other, uh, other places and in the museum store when you come visit <laughs> that uh, will give you an idea of what model railroading is all about. And there are many of those, uh, and they give you kind of a little taste, and they give you lots of connections and things you can do. And, of course, NMRA.org will give you a website, a portal into uh, our association, which can help you get into the hobby. Yeah, we have a beginner's page, for example. There's, there's all, all sorts of help. One of the things, you know, and I, I've, I've had the fortune of, good fortune of speaking, uh, you know, at some mm -hmm. of the NMRA yes, events and just talking about what we're doing at the museums and, you know, and, and all of that. Um, but there's really, a really strong sense of community and oh, yes, also a yes. strong sense of, you should do it, and I'll help. <laughs> and it's worldwide hobby, so every time Margaret, my wife, and I go overseas, <laughs> we have friends we haven't met yet who are model railroaders, and that opens doors you would never yeah, believe. It, it so really, it's fun. It's a it, great hobby. It really is a, a, just a, a sure. wonderful a community of, of folks. Uh, again, we'll just invite everybody to come down. We're open 10 to 5 tomorrow. We're going to take the stanchion off, and people are just going to be able to come through and check That's it out great. out there at their leisure. It's really an amazing thing. What a remarkable accomplishment. Well, thank you. Um, I feel fortunate uh, to have the association. I know it strengthens uh, not only what we do, but why we do it. 
and I just want to thank you and, well, and all welcome. of the support. I know that, that <laughs> you're the face of it, and rightly so. We ought to be celebrating you, but there's a, a whole long list there's of people who list of people. have uh, give, given everything from well wishes to financial support to make uh, to make it happen. And, and that includes and, the museum staff who has, who has been nothing but oh. fantastic to work with, and your foundation members, of which I am one, by the way, uh, which uh, uh, who... Uh, have been so supportive of everything you've been doing. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you again for My spending pleasure. some time with us, giving this preview to sure. our, our members. Thank you, members, for tuning in. Uh, we're going to kick it over to Cheryl Marcel, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Great. Thank you so much, Charlie, and thank you, Ty. Uh, exhibits like this would not be possible without the financial support of our members and our donors. We know that the last year has been a struggle for many, and we sincerely thank you for your continued financial support. If you are not a member, please consider joining. If you are a member, please consider an additional gift. All your resources help support the great exhibits in this wonderful world-class museum. Membership always has its benefits, right? Including admission to the great California State Railroad Museum, excursion rides on the Sacramento Southern Railroad, and admission and excursion train rides at our sister park, Railtown 1897 State Historic Park. More information can be found on our website, californiarailroad.museum. We hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation, and we look forward to welcoming you back to the museum to see this wonderful exhibit. As Ty mentioned, you're gonna wanna wear your mask. We have these great museum nerds masks for sale in the museum store. We want to be safe. We want to be sure we're taking care of the community. And we can't wait to share this exciting exhibit with you. So on behalf of the California State Railroad Museum, the foundation, thank you so much and have a very good night.